introduce like you know, Professor Wen Van Rees from MIT. So Professor Wen Van Rees is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at MIT. Uh, he received his bachelor and master's degree from uh, Delft University of Technology in Marine Technology. And uh, he received his uh, PhD from ETS Zurich. And from 2015 and 2017, uh, he did his research, like a very good research as a postdoc fellow in like a School of Engineering and Applied Science at Harvard University. And then he moved to MIT, joined as a faculty member. Um, Starting from starting his uh, as a, like a uh, uh, assistant professor, he already secured a lot of distinguished like you know, award, including Department of Early, uh, Energy of Early Career Award and also Army Research Office Early Career Award. With that, I want to give the like you know, floor to Professor Wen Van Rees for his exciting talk today. Wen. All right. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm so glad there's a, a lot of people showing up uh, after doing this for it feels like forever. Um, so one of the nice things about the virtual format, I guess, is that everyone from around the world gets together. Um, so yeah, good evening, good afternoon, good morning. I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, the research I have done with my postdoc, David Bernanes Gutierrez, who is in the picture there, on uh, the effect of leading edge curvature actuation on um, flapping fin performance. And this research was published uh, earlier this year in JFM. And so, you know, the details are there. We're following up with some uh, uh, you know, some, for some more studies on this, but uh, I just wanted to kind of lay out the baseline of what we've done so far and, and where we stand in this problem. Um, so by means of, you know, the general kind of introduction of, of how, how I see the, the, the relevance of this topic is that when we, um, you know, uh, as, as, you know, evidenced by the title of this seminar, we are interested in bio-inspired devices. And so if we take a look at what nature is doing um, for its, propulsion solutions, um, we see that there's a, a lot of uh, complicated phenomena going on, including a combination of soft materials, uh, active actuation, uh, sensing, um, and all of this has basically gotten to together through, through evolutionary design. And, and there's a, a, a very um, great amount of versatility and agility coming out of these solutions, right, that, that are so far not well uh, mimicked by man-made devices. We can do, you know, we can do straight line uh, uh, propulsion in a very, very good way, but we do not match the versatility and agility. And that comes in a large part from through the adaptation and uh, sensing abilities of these of these um, animals. So uh, there are some developments though in engineering that that have helped me inspire this this topic, right? And that is the uh, emergence of smart soft structures, soft robotics, additive manufacturing. And then on the computer science side, the optimization and AI that allows us to tackle more, more complicated problems uh, from essentially a, a control perspective. And so that has given rise to new soft robotics that are uh, such as this one from uh, Daniela Ross's group uh, at MIT, uh, one from Harvard, another soft robotics with very bio-inspired materials here. And then, you know, if I made my put my own little research there, we have done some work on the on the kind of additive manufacturing and 4D printing side that allowed us to create uh, a flat printed shape that deforms into a very complicated three dimensional surface after actuation. And in this case, actuation was just changing the temperature of the uh, environment. And so we could print a, a lattice that was flat and then morph it into the shape of a human face. And that is to me very promising because that means we can think about active control and very precise control of surfaces and try to use that in, uh, for instance, a bio-inspired context. And so that possibility gives rise to the question, well, what do we gain? What, we, what do we stand to gain from that uh, ability? Right? And that's part of the, the inspiration for this research. So if I look at the functional design of a bio-inspired swimmer, I can think of different complexities. And so on the left, we have the standard kind of rigid body uh, design. So what is the geometry? What are the kinematics if we impose that? But then when we get into soft materials, we add the passive elastic deformation of the of materials on that. And so we have to think not only about the geometry and the kinematics, but also about, the, say, the stiffness of the materials and the distribution of those stiffnesses across, say, a flapping fin propulsor. Then if we can add actuation here to the problem, we get even more complicated because now we have to think about a control policy, how to you know, control the degrees of freedom that, and how to choose the degrees of freedom that we have and how to control them, right? So we have a, a fluid structure interaction problem combined with a, a kind of a control problem, a design problem for, 
the control degree of freedom. And then ideally, we'd like to somehow close the loop through uh, learning AI, um, you know, some inverse design on the control side where we can work towards autonomous operation by using sensory perception as an input rather than our kind of, you know, engineered, you know, control policy that we came up with, right? So if we can come up with a, a feedback loop there and, and use learning, we are moving towards fully kind of autonomous operation. And so this talk is, uh, I've done work on, you know, different aspects of this, of this scheme here. Um, this work fits more in this top right corner where I'm kind of bunching together the passive and active degrees of freedom into what I will um, consider kind of an imposed uh, shape variation of the fin. And so I'm kind of abstracting away, but I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that later. That later. So if we go specifically to the problem of uh, a flapping fin uh, deformation, right? So this is a, a movie uh, from one of the papers of George Lauder um, that I took from the SI of that work where they basically filmed uh, a bluegill sunfish from above in a water, water tunnel. And so you, you can see very well the caudal fin. Um, if you look closely, it's a bit grainy, but you see the deformation, right? So there's a lot of you know, uh, deformation of this fin going on. We don't necessarily know exactly what uh, to what extent this is passive versus active. We do know that the fish has a lot of um, active control over its fin shape, right? So we, we it's, it's in some sense, you know, the, the how that deformation comes about is maybe one problem, but the first problem might be what is the effect of this deformation on the hydrodynamic performance? And that's the part I'll, I'll talk about today. So if we look at, you know, the, the flapping fin model, which is what I'll use in this study, and we compare it to how a swimmer swims, right? I, I have here an illustrative undulatory swimmer. You can come up with many models. This is one of them. And so if we look at time going from right to left, so the swimmer is swimming from right to left, and we look at different snapshots during its stroke, and we highlight the shape of its tail, right, in this red kind of part here, we can think of that as a flapping fin with um, midline deformation, right? So if I take out that red part and I just close it with uh, some sort of streamlined kind of uh, leading edge here, you know, we get a flapping fin that moves up and down. There's pitching, there's heaving, but there's also curvature, right? And that is the part that I'm interested in here. Uh, and that is opposed to most flapping fin studies where you look at the heaving and the pitching, you know, there's a typically harmonic heaving, harmonic pitching going on with some sort of phase difference. So you have amplitudes for both, you have a phase shift and that three, you know, dimensional parameter space governs the flapping fin problem. We add to that, you know, the effect of heave to be closer to what, you know, a, a, a fish is, is doing in, uh, in kind of normal operation, if you want. Okay, so that's kind of the context of where we're at. If we look at what could cause that deformation, um, you know, we can, roughly distinguished between the fact that the fin is made out of you know elastic materials soft materials that deform due to hydrodynamic loading so the hydrodynamic loading leads to passive elastic deformation and this has been investigated uh, quite a bit through fluid structure interaction either simulations or experiments because you know that is uh, uh, you know you you add to the degrees of freedom of the flapping fin study some sort of sense of what what is the stiffness of this fin right and then you look at mostly efficiency right because that 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 is uh, a way to enhance the efficiency of your swimming. But there is also the intrinsic musculature, right? So the fin has, the fish, most ray finned fish have active shape control. Uh, these are two papers by George Lauder and uh, Silas Alban uh, investigating, you know, the kind of the more mechanical side of it. How, how do the fins, um, how do the fish manage to curve their fins actively? And if you consider that as a degree of freedom, then now you have a much more uh, open space of possible shapes that you can achieve compared to looking only at passive deformations. And so what we do here, instead of you know, throwing in the mechanical properties of the fin into the mix, we are looking mostly at what is the effect of a combination of passive and active you know, shape deformation on the geometry of the fin, and then you know, impose that geometry and try to look at the hydrodynamic, uh, the change in hydrodynamic performance due to that geometry. So instead of investigating the large fluid structure design space, we investigate here the effect of imposed curvature variations. And the idea is that, you know, if you can come up with a, a geometry that works very well, then that could serve as a design point for the fluid structure interaction study that follows afterwards, right? So if you know what shape you want to achieve, then, then you can, you know, try to solve an inverse problem to find the stiffness distribution for a given, you know, set of constraints that gets you there. But we don't want to like go down to that level quite yet. We, so, so what I'm talking about is not fluid structure interaction. It's not two-way coupling between the shape and the flow. It's imposing the, the geometric shape of the fin with some curvature and effecting, 
uh, investigating how that affects the um, hydrodynamic performance. So that's kind of the onset of um, how we, uh, you know, frame our, our, our work here. Um, we've done everything numerically. And so we have solved the 3D incompressible Navier-Stokes equations in the vorticity velocity form using 2D and 3D simulations. And we handle boundary conditions using volume penalization. And I put a citation there. And at this point, I'm gonna, you know, do a little sidestep in my talk. I'll come back to the flapping fin and the leading edge curvature, but I just wanna, you know, highlight some of the recent work we've been doing in the lab on the numerical side of things, and then I'll come back to the flapping fin performance. So I'll do a little numerical method sidestep, um, and then we'll get back to the flapping fin performance. So uh, I mentioned volume penalization, right? So, so far, uh, you know, most of my work has been done using volume penalization methods, where basically you take uh, a Cartesian grid and you impose a body on it through some sort of smooth discretization of the boundary. You add a forcing term to the Navier-Stokes equations here in vorticity velocity form, and this term on the right here with the lambda, that is our forcing term. So lambda is supposed to be a parameter much larger than one. Chi is a shape, that, a function that exists on the grid that indicates basically it's a color function, where's the body, where's the flow. And then the body velocity is uh, this US there. That's the thing you want to impose inside the body. And so that has served us really well, but you know, it has some intrinsic constraints, this method. It's uh, the way at least we have it is first order in time, first order in space in the infinity norm. Uh, it's difficult to extract accurate local surface quantities. If we want to look at, say, a pressure or a vorticity on the surface, that's hard because the surface doesn't really exist. It's a smooth transition. And it's difficult to extend to multi-physics systems. Uh, but on the plus side, it's very flexible and very easy to implement. So it has served as well, but uh, it's always bothered me a little bit that the fact that you know this is a, a, a dynamic forcing term to impose basically what are kinematic boundary conditions uh, just leads to intrinsic kind of problems, right? So you have to take small time steps, you have to uh, either or do an implicit or an iterative approach, uh, and none of that you know, sits, sits very well. And I'd like to go to higher order methods that are uh, you know, give us more freedom to extend to other problems as well. So in the lab, we've been working on the immersed interface method based on some work uh, done at UC Louvain in Belgium. And we've extended that to uh, 2D problems with uh, multiple bodies. And in immersed interface method, what you're doing is you're discretizing the boundaries uh, sharply, right? So at any, for any shape, you're looking at the intersections between the shape and the grid lines, and then, uh, you know, enforcing boundary conditions at those points rather than in this smooth region that indicates the trade change from flow to body. And so if you look at the Navier-Stokes equations, you're basically not no longer you know, enforcing the boundary conditions dynamically, but you're imposing it kinematically. And that leads to some benefits. We can do third order in time, second order in space. We could extend to fourth order in space pretty easily. Uh, this is a sharp interface method now, so we can extract local service quantities. They're part of the problem, in fact. And uh, this generalizes to other boundary conditions and coupled systems. So if we want to go to fluid structure interaction or two-phase flows, then this is a, a very good approach to uh, build upon. But you know, sharp interface leads to other problems or maybe challenges. So for instance, in 2D, if you have multiple or even a single body, you have to enforce Kelvin's law for circulation. And uh, we've done uh, some work to fix that. So our status on this numerical method is that we have uh, uh, submitted a paper a few months ago on the immersed interface method with multiple stationary and moving bodies in 2D, and this gets us uh, second order space convergence, third order time convergence, and we're working on the, the extension to two-way coupling where the body you know, is basically self-propelled. And uh, to extend all of that to 3D uh, and, and do all of this you know, in, a, in a 3D context, we are working on a multi-resolution wavelet-based uh, adaptive grid framework uh, with Thomas Gillis, who is in that uh, right picture. Uh, James Gabbard is on the left, he's doing the IAM work. And the wavelets basically give us a very clean way to, you know, compress or refine uh, a grid based on, you know, the scales of, of the signal that lives on the grid. And it gives us an in intrinsic way to do ghost reconstruction. And if we, we're, we're implementing second generation wavelets on, as well as first generation wavelets. And so that ensures that we can not only compress and refine well, but also conserve some of the moments of the field as we do so, right? So you can conserve maybe circulation, or if you have a scalar, you conserve the mass of that scale. Um, and so those are some, some nice features of the wavelets. Um, that is currently in preparation. Uh, some early results are, uh, this is not a vortex ring, this is just a field that we're moving, but this highlights how the grid is adapting to the moving shape automatically, right? So it's automatically finding what are the scales and what is the, what is the resolution I need to resolve those scales given a certain error threshold. 
and then we let it go and the grid is following the shape well. And uh, a detail here is that we can, you know, do anisotropic domains, right? So we, we do, can do like many, what are essentially octrees boxes next to each other to do like elongated domains, which are very helpful in, in problems like the ones I'm talking about here. Okay, so that's coming. Uh, that is my little sidestep into the numerical methods. Right now, we're still moving, we're still using the volume penalization framework, which is fine and, and works well. It's just not as maybe efficient as, as it could be. Uh, and, and hopefully our new methods will be in the future. Okay, so we go back to the fins. Uh, this is uh, 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 you know, the leading edge curvature story. So we have the numerical solver. Uh, we solve the Navier-Stokes equations. Boundary conditions are handled using penalization. Uh, and then the rest of the setting of the problem is that we're looking at three hydrodynamic metrics, the thrust coefficients, power coefficients, and the efficiency uh, average through a cycle. Um, we are fixing the geometry of the fin as a trapezoid. We set the thickness variation in a quartwise direction as a NACA fin and a spanwise direction as an ellipse. And then we fix the heaving and pitching kinematics at typical swimming conditions. Um, the heaving and pitch are both harmonic. We set the pitch out of phase with the heave um, we have a fixed amplitude of the heave of 0.4 relative to the chord, amplitude of the pitch of 30 degrees, Trula number is 0.3, and the Reynolds number is 1500. <coughs> so those are parameters that we fixed throughout this study. Uh, I do have some results at higher Trula numbers at the very end, um, but uh, the rest of the kinematics are basically fixed to these, to these settings. Um, based on you know, common swimming conditions, mostly geared probably to, towards maybe uh, efficiency rather than thrust generation. Okay, so here's an example of how that looks like. This is just a 3D simulation of one of our cases under these conditions, because maybe it's more informative to look at the flow rather than these, these, these abstract numbers. Um, so this is a pretty standard kind of 3D flapping fin uh, scenario with a way consisting of these vortex ring. And Reynolds 1500 is, uh, is, is decently high to show some of the uh, unsteadiness in the flow here. All right. So then how do we parameterize the shape, right? So we are investigating the effect of leading edge curvature variations. And so we have to somehow find a way to parameterize the shape of the fin uh, associated with leading edge curvature variations. And uh, then, you know, find what is the effect of these, these parameters onto the hydrodynamic performance. So we capture the 3D mid-surface geometry in a, in, a, in a kind of general framework that, that allows us to, you know, write down uh, 3D surfaces under some constraints. Um, and to do so, we have a, a, a coordinate system that lives on the fin. We have a curvilinear direction u, which follows what are uh, inextensible rays. These are material lines on the fin uh, that connect the leading edge to the trailing edge. So these are the dashed lines in this figure here, where the leading edge is blue and the trailing edge is in red. Um, then following from that, we create an orthonormal coordinate system uh, at our boo frame, which is basically formed by that, that uh, 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 tangential vector to the ray, the normal vector to the surface, and then the binormal vector as the cross product of those two. And with that Darbu frame, which is basically a variation of the Frenet frame for a curve, right? But now the normal vector is, is fixed by the surface normal. Uh, we can write down these ordinary differential equations to uh, basically uh, relate those three vectors to each other through um, what are three you know, curvatures from you know, the geometry world. Uh, those are the normal curvature, the geodesic curvature, and the geodesic torsion. And so if we can find a way to specify those three curvatures over the surface of the, over the mid surface of the fin, we can construct the fin, uh, the, the, the 3D geometry of the fin. And the way we do that is that we use the normal curvature as the input. And so this is the thing that we're gonna impose, the time varying curvature of each ray. So a function of you know, the space, the mid surface and a function of time. And then we're gonna solve for these other two components by assuming that the mid surface is inextensible and that we have a smooth, right, a, a, a smooth surface in the spanwise direction. And those two constraints allow us to solve for the other two components of the uh, system of uh, equations here and only work with the normal curvature. So we've reduced the problem to, okay, how do we parameterize the normal curvature of this thing? And what's the suitable parameterization for that? Um, and this is in general a function of u, the chordwise coordinate, and v, the spanwise coordinate, and time. And so the way we do that is through a couple of assumptions to bring down the parameter space. And uh, we hope those assumptions are uh, well uh, validated, but those also lead to you know, need for more research in the future. Uh, the first assumption is that we assume the, the curvature is constant along each ray. So we take out the dependency on u and we just assume that it's a function of the spanwise coordinate and time. 
That means that each ray is essentially a circular arc along the court, right? It, it deforms, if we change kappa, we change the, the radius of curvature of that uh, circular arc. Um, the second assumption is that we're gonna assume something about the time dependency here. And we're gonna assume that the court vice curvature variations are in phase with the heat. So it's harmonic in phase with heat. That's based on uh, that, that video here uh, where we see that you know, the, 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 the um, curvature variation seem to match pretty well uh, the, the heave motion, right? So we have during the pitching, when heave is zero, we have no curvature and then the curvature is maximum at uh, you know, the, 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 the extrema of the heave motion. And then the third assumption is that we assume that the spanwise curvature is out of phase with heave which is essentially equivalent to doing uh, a first order approximation of a phase shift on the curvature that varies quadratically with the height, right, with V. And so what that leads us then, uh, the, 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 very, the, the, the parameterization of kappa n then leads to something like this. So remember heave was uh, uh, sine here and then pitch was out of phase with the heave. So it's a minus cosine. And then the kappa n as a function of V and T is written in our parameterization as one coefficient times the courtwise curvature variation so is the courtwise curvature parameter. And then a spanwise curvature parameter times V squared because we want it to be symmetric um, times the out of phase component. And so we have a courtwise curvature amplitude and a spanwise curvature amplitude. And those are the two parameters that we're gonna investigate. Right? So we have brought down this whole problem to like two parameters uh, under these assumptions. And then to be complete, we have to you know, take into account some corrections here for the plant form shape because you know, the rays might not be horizontal, but they might go up or down and the trading edge might have you know, some sort of uh, vertical shape to it that, that leads to the rays being not equi, equi length, right? Um, so we have some corrections there, but basically we have these two parameters, courtwise and spanwise curvature amplitude dictating the courtwise curvature variations in phase with heave and the spanwise curvature variations phase with pitch. Okay. And so the question is, what is the effect of these two parameters on the hydrodynamic performance? And so to do that, we just, we simulated them, right? And so here, uh, here are actually some, some visualizations of how that looks like. Maybe two first before looking at the results, because it might make sense to have a visual picture of that. So if we have a, a rigid fin here, um, this is just flapping under those fixed uh, parameters. If we add the effect of, court, of courtwise curvature variations, and I hope the video um, works decently well on, on Zoom. But on the right, we have what is effectively a large positive courtwise parameter. And on the left, we have a large negative courtwise parameter. And then if we look at the spanwise curvature, we have a large spanwise curvature parameter on the top, a, a negative one on the bottom. And then we can combine these guys, right? So we have uh, you know, different combinations of cordwise and spanwise curvatures here in the corners. And it's already interesting that some of these shapes look much more natural in a way, uh, which is not very scientific, but it, it looks more intuitive. For instance, the one in the top left here looks almost like a passively deforming fin, right? Under some, uh, you know, assuming it's, it's like a soft material or something. And the one on the bottom right here looks like it's doing a lot of active work to, to you know, reach that shape under normal kind of underwater swimming conditions. Okay, so this is the phase diagram, right? So we have, uh, you know, courtwise left to right and spanwise top to bottom. And now we can put the results on this phase diagram. So here we have the effect of uh, spanwise curvature top on the vertical axis and courtwise curvature on the horizontal axis on thrust. And here we can see, for instance, rigid fin would be at zero, zero. And so the effect of the, uh, the maximum thrust coefficient here is in the red dot here. The, 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 the rigid would be the gray. And we can get about 15% increase in the thrust coefficient by adjusting what seems to be mostly the courtwise curvature, right? And a little bit of spanwise curvature. Um, so thrust has an optimum at positive AC, maximum thrust 15% over rigid fin. Uh, power increases with, uh, so this is the power coefficient it seems to increase with AC and decrease with AS. So if we go up, we have a lower power for, for a constant courtwise curvature coefficient. If we go right, we have a higher power for the same spanwise curvature coefficient. And then if we look at the efficiency, which is the ratio of these two, we can see that the optimum happens right in this top left corner, right? Which I just said seems to be like a, a very natural kind of shape on the eye. It's, it, it, it turns out that is also the most efficient way of moving. And the spanwise curvature uh, actually has, 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 has quite a bit more of an effect on the efficiency 
than on the thrust. And so we have a peak for efficiency at negative AC, positive AS, and we have about 18% efficiency gain over a rigid fin by uh, doing these uh, curvature variations. Okay, so let's look a little bit about these two effects separate. So let's look first at the effect of courtwise curvature. And the first thing to keep in mind here when we vary the courtwise curvature at the leading edge is that we're not only varying the camber of the fin, we're not only the shape of the fin, of the, of the, of the fin we're also varying the uh, leading edge kinematics because as this thing is curving, it's gonna you know, put the leading edge kinematics, uh, the trailing edge kinematics, uh, the, for instance, the amplitude of the trailing edge motion is gonna increase or decrease depending on the curvature coefficient. So right up front, we can already distinguish between the effect of essentially what is camber or like midline uh, deformation and the effect of trailing edge uh, kinematics, right? And so that's, that's pretty easy to do. So we can investigate first, what does the effective pitch variation, uh, what effect does it have? If we don't, if we exclude the midline deformation. So we just connect the leading and trading edge with a straight line and investigate what is the effect of that additional you know, kinematics over the standard rigid fin that we already have. So both of these fins would be rigid, they're just different pitch kinematics. And then the second question is, what is the effect of camber on top of that, right? And so we've done that. Uh, it turns out we, with our simple curvature parameterization, we can pretty much, uh, we can analytically extract the effective pitching kinematics as what are, you know, the standard rigid fin, our baseline, plus a constant, a coefficient that is, uh, or a term that is multiplied by the courtwise curvature value times uh, a sign, uh, an out-of-phase component, right? And so we have reference pitch and then curvature induced pitch. And so if we take a rigid fin and up, like a, a not deforming fin and apply this pitching kinematics to it, we can investigate what happens you know, to that as a function of AC, as a function of this courtwise curvature coefficient. So here's what that looks like. Um, this is a rigid reference fin in the center. Time goes from left to from right to left. This is uh, one courtwise curving fin with negative AC and one with positive AC. And you can see that these uh, trailing edge kinematics are pretty different, right? They're wildly, you know, this one is, is, has a much larger amplitude. And so we capture that by these, what we call kappa pitch fins. So these are, these are fins that, have, that are rigid, just like this one. So they're not deforming, but the trailing edge positions are gonna be always the same as the equivalent deforming fin under that value of AC. And so we can affect, we can now investigate what is the effect of AC on the kappa pitch fin, on the rigid fin with the modified training edge kinematics. And that turns out to be pretty large. Um, so here's uh, an example. This is the rigid fin at three points in time. So non-dimensional time one, 1.25, 1.5. I'm looking at here the fin at its, you know, maximum, so zero heave, maximum pitch, zero pitch, maximum heave, and then going back down. Uh, here we have uh, velocity arrows that indicate the inflow velocity, the heave induced velocity and the uh, resultant, sorry, at the leading edge. And here we have the force uh, vector. So we have a vertical component, which is lift, the, ver the horizontal component, which is thrust if it goes to the left. And um, that, you know, is plotted on top of this fin. And then on the right, what we have is uh, the value of the thrust coefficient. We're specifically focusing on thrust here. I'll, I'll talk about efficiency later. Uh, as a function of uh, the, you know, the different points in the cycle. So uh, upstroke, downstroke, and then upstroke again. And so we see already like the red line, which is the rigid fin and both the curved and the kappa pitch fin at this large value of AC, they are pretty different, right? So the amplitudes are much larger and also the mean turns out to be larger, um, at least for the kappa pitch fin than the, the red one. And we'll look at that in a second. But if we look at the, the time evolution of the, of the vector, of the force vector, right? We see that for the rigid fin, this is just standard, right? During the upstroke, we have uh, the, the maximum kind of thrust component here at FT is one, which is like here. The maximum happens a little bit later, um, but then during the um, reversal of the vertical motion, we have essentially what is the negative thrust, right? So a drag, we have a small component of this horizontal term to the right. And then it's the symmetric version when we go down. If we look at the kappa pitch fin, so the yellow line in this plot here, you see immediately that during this upstroke here, we have a much larger thrust vector. Uh, basically, everything seems to be scaled up. It's not just the thrust, it's also the lift. The entire force vector has gone up. Um, and then during the reversal part here, we have a much larger drag force here, right? And so we have a, a much, large, much lower 
uh, or a larger negative thrust down here, and then a much larger positive thrust here. And then that here it's the same thing again. So what causes that? The reason for that is that this uh, kappa pitch fin has much larger training edge kinematics, uh, much larger training edge velocity. So it's sweeping this very large vertical plane of motion. And so the added mass effect of a, um, a pitching fin is uh, proportional to the value to the uh, uh, or is related to the trading edge velocity. And so the larger thrust coefficient of this kappa pitch fin, we think is primarily related to the trading edge velocity. And then by, extent, by you know, extension, the, the added mass effect of what is a flapping fin. Here we have, of course, the heave motion on top of that. So we get a much more complicated picture. But uh, in essence, we think the, the trading edge velocity is the key kind of parameter here that distinguishes whether this fin has a, a you know the reference thrust here or this much larger thrust during the during the uh, stroke part, like the positive thrust part of the stroke. Um, if we look at the effect of curvature here, we see that you know during this FT1 we have no cordwise curvature by virtue of the the cordwise curvature being uh, in phase with the heat, and the thrust vector seems to be very similar, right? A little bit smaller, and you can see that from here as well. There's a a very similar thrust value with FT1. Then as this thing is uh, reversing its stroke, we see that this, this curvature here is increasing the drag, right? We have a drag error that's much larger during this point in time. And as confirmed here, we have a much lower uh, CT, much more, a larger negative value of CT. Um, and we think that's related to the fact that, you know, this curvature is actually not helping. Right? The midline deformation of this fin is not helping its uh, performance. This is inducing more drag because at this point in time, we're, we're not generating a lot of thrust, right? We're just you know, trying to reverse our motion to go into the next kind of thrust generation part of the stroke. And so in this case, the curvature is uh, primarily responsible for changing the training edge kinematics. And we can do even better if we just remove the curvature and just focus on the training edge kinematics. That's kind of the, the, um, the conclusion here. The kappa pitch and the curve fin both have large trailing edge velocities during the upstroke compared to the rigid fin, this close to an increase in CT. But then if we compare only kappa pitch and curving fins, which have the same trailing edge velocity, we see that the camber of the curved fin or the midline deformation leads to actually an increased drag to compare to the kappa pitch configuration. And so that reduces the CT again compared to the kappa pitch. And so how does that all look uh, when we look at the mean thrust coefficient. So here's the graph of the mean thrust coefficient uh, as a function of AC. The rigid one is the gray dot, right? So it's about 0.16. The curved one exceeds, as we've seen in the, as we've seen in the original kind of phase diagram, it exceeds the thrust coefficient of this rigid one. The kappa pitch one does way better at very large ACs because it doesn't have the detriment effect of this, of this midline deformation. And it still has all the benefits of the trading edge velocities. So the curving fin outperforms the reference rigid fin in thrust, despite the unfavorable camber, but there's a turning point, right? Where the camber, the, the negative effect of the camber win. Uh, the kappa pitch fin outperforms both of them, right? Due to increased tailing velocity without having that camber. Um, and then, sorry, if we look at um, power and efficiency, we see for power, they're pretty similar. There's not a lot of difference. For efficiency though, because the power goes up uh, at a higher order than the thrust, uh, it turns out that the efficiency is optimum at the negative AC values. And in the negative AC values, we see that the curved fin actually does a little bit better because in that regime, the, the midline deformation helps, right? It's actually uh, a favorable deformation compared to the kappa pitch fin. So the, the, the kappa pitch, pitch fin doesn't seem to outperform the rigid fin at all in efficiency, but the curved fin does, right? So the curved fin outperforms both the reference rigid fin and the kappa pitch efficiency pitch fin inefficiency due to variable k mark at the negative AC values. Okay, so if we look now at the effect of spanwise curvature, so this is all quartwise curvature and we've reproduced all these effects in 2D, right? So it's not necessarily a 3D thing here. This is all kind of quartwise curvature for 2D or uh, our 3D fin is, is qualitatively very similar. Spanwise curvature though is, a, is a intrinsically a 3D uh, phenomenon. So we can look at the effect of spanwise curvature uh, and here is again the, the thrust coefficients and the power coefficients for uh, the entire kind of phase space. If we just compare at zero quartwise curvature, a positive and a negative spanwise curvature in both thrust and power. Uh, so here are the two cases, positive spanwise curvature on the left. This is how it's, uh, 
how it's flapping. And the negative is on the on the right. Sorry, let me go again. Then what you can see is that um, from the data here, the same thrust, uh, both, both cases have approximately the same thrust. So they sit approximately on an isocontour of thrust, but the power is drastically different between the two. The positive spanwise curvature has about 30% decrease in power compared to the negative spanwise curvature. And we think it's related to the fact that, you know, the, the positive spanwise curvature cases are having a, a much reduced pitching angle of the top and bottom rays. And you can see that here, right? These top and bottom rays are essentially not undergoing as large a pitching amplitude as the center of the fin. And so because of that, um, positive spanwise curvature coefficient leads to reduced pitching angles for the outer rays compared to the center ray. And we can see that if we look at only the power induced by the moment times the angular velocity, the which is one of the main components of this plot here, that power component is significantly, significantly reduced with positive spanwise curvature coefficients. Um, at the same time, what's interesting is that the thrust doesn't seem to suffer from that, right? So the thrust is mostly generated through the center part of the fin. And whatever happens at the, fin, at the tips where we reduce the pitching angle doesn't seem to matter too much to the overall thrust production. And so that leads to the uh, efficiency being much larger up here than down here. Okay. Here's what we uh, investigated when we increased, increased this tool number, what we saw when we increased this tool number. So we went from 0.3 in blue to 0.6 in red. And these are all values, thrust, power, and efficiency relative to the respective rigid fin at that tool number, right? Because the absolute values are different. So we wanted to compare to reference to the rigid fin. And you can see that uh, positive AC leads to about 50% almost increase uh, compared to the rigid fin. Uh, negative AC, this is only the effect of cordwise curvature, by the way, we didn't look at spanwise curvature for this. Negative efficiency is 40% uh, at least, it might go up a little bit, increase over the rigid fin with uh, uh, the leading edge curvature actuations. And we think it's, it's mostly related to the same effects as for this, the low straw now. Okay, so uh, in summary, uh, we've looked at the effect of leading edge curvature variations. We've seen that this can enhance thrust when the cordwise curvature is larger than zero. Spanwise curvature doesn't seem to matter too much for that. Uh, or efficiency when the cordwise curvature coefficient is smaller than zero and the spanwise curvature coefficient is larger than zero over a rigid fin. Um, we think that the main thrust enhancement mechanism is due to the favorable change in effective pitch and the associated trading edge velocity. Um, we think that the main efficiency enhancement mechanisms are that the camber is favorable at the negative courtwise curvature coefficients, which is basically, you know, the camber is, is not kind of opposed to what, what, a, what a, you know, a normal kind of airfoil would, would experience. Uh, it's actually in, in line with what a quasi-static analysis would suggest is, is better. And also the reduced tip pitching angles at positive spanwise curvature coefficients. And both of these reduce power disproportionately over thrust. And so that leads to uh, the higher efficiency. Uh, the effects are just amplified, that's the number, um, and all the cordwise curvature effects are reproduced in 2D, um, so those seem to be pretty robust. Um, so if we take this to a bigger discussion, right, because it might seem pretty uh, maybe uh, anticlimactic that the, the, it seems that the kappa pitch does even better than the normal fin, so what would be the, than the curving fin, so what would be the benefit of doing leading edge curvature actuation over, say, controlling directly the pitch angle, and I think uh, you know, this is a discussion, but um, in terms of uh, looking at the fin as a part of a bigger, you know, a, a self-propelled body, uh, I think that the uh, leading edge curvature allows uh, a very large effective range of hydrodynamic performance, including maximum efficiency. The maximum efficiency is only achieved with leading edge curvature actuation here, by the way, not, not through the kappa pitch uh, fin. But what the leading edge curvature provides is a way to control the shape of the fin localized, right? So the pitching kinematics in a way arise from the entire body undulations, right? But the curvature actuation is local, right? We can have musculature, the, fin, the fish has musculature at the base of the fin and it allows the, that allows it to change its shape locally. Uh, and that might be beneficial over it, say changing the entire body undulations because that might happen on a larger time scale uh, it might you know, be related to, to other effects. So the curvature would be uh, a way to fine tune uh, or correct or adjust whatever the body undulations give rise to uh, 
on a localized way rather than over the entire body. And the other part of curvature actuation could be that, you know, uh, if we look back at what causes curvature actuation in real life, it could be part of it due to the elastic deformation of the fin. And so, you know, roughly maybe the negative court wise coefficient range could be achieved by uh, passive deformation. So if you design a fin with the stiffness distribution appropriate, we might be able to reach the negative, the shapes associated with negative cordwise coefficients. And so, you know, that, that is just then within reach of, you know, a, a passively deforming fin. It doesn't require any energy. It's just automatic, um, automatically achieved by the shape itself. And so part of the beneficial deformations could be offloaded to just, you know, the hydrodynamic loading and the mechanical response of the fin given a, a structural design. And uh, the last part that, you know, if you consider the bigger picture of leading edge curvature actuation, we only looked at symmetric vertical spanwise actuations, right? But you can also think of like a term that is linear in V. And so then you can, you know, adjust the uh, role of the, of the swimmer. You can do all sorts of, you know, more intricate maneuvering if you have this control over the leading edge curvature. So in plane, out of plane maneuvering. And that's uh, something that would be interesting to study in the future. Um, but it's definitely uh, uh, something that you can achieve through leading edge curvature actuation and not say by adjusting the, the pitching over the, the pitching angle of the fin itself. So the, our future work uh, and current work, in fact, is going to be to uh, unravel the effect of pitching camber variations for different uh, also phase shifts of cordwise and spanwise curvatures with respect to heave and pitch. So these are two things, right? One is the phase shift. Uh, you know, what if the curvature is not in phase with heave, but maybe some, is there an optimum phase difference uh, on the curvature compared to heave and pitch? And the other part of it is, uh, you know, what if we adjust the trailing edge kinematics or fix the trailing edge kinematics and just look at the effect of camber? And uh, we have some pretty solid indication from this study that, you know, there's a favorable camber and an unfavorable camber. And our early results on, on doing that study seem to confirm that. So we see efficiency at you know, negative AC uh, uh, values. We see high thrust also at regions where the camber actually helps uh, the performance uh, uh, if, the trailing, if the trailing edge kinematics are fixed, right? So if we take that out of the equation, the picture looks uh, a little bit different. Uh, so that's, uh, stay tuned, that's coming up. Um, so that's it. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions or you know, discuss this further on either the numerics or the, uh, or this leading edge curvature actuation um, study. But thank you all for, for, for listening and uh, I'm happy yep. to take questions. Okay, thanks Wim for this very informative and great talk. I have a lot of questions, but before like, you know, if I can uh, release my questions like as a Kraken, so not a Kraken, so, but uh, allow me to let the like audience, if the audience have some questions to, um, to ask like Professor, uh, uh, when Van Rees, like, you know, so. You can unmute yourself or raise your hand or type into like in a chat box. So. Can you hear me, Dicia? Yeah, Jeffrey, go ahead. Yeah, Jeffrey, go ahead. And William, you can hear me? I can hear you, yeah. So, yeah. so, you, you, you had uh, three, three different types of curvature, rigid and the kappa and the cordwise. The, are, there, are, there, are there fishes so bony that they're closer to the rigid? Is that a real thing or is that just a reference? Um, um. It's, it's a reference in the sense that that is, you know, the bulk it's, it's of the literature of having fins is done on rigid fins. So it's a reference in that sense that we, uh, like 90% of the information we have in flapping fin performance is for, is for rigid fins. And so it does constitute the bulk of the results, right? So the, the rigid is uh, the low order approximation that you want to take to investigate, you know, the effect of heave and pitch uh, kinematics. Um, uh, so, um, so we're trying to find the increment, right? What what can we gain from, from having curvature or having deformation of the fin, not just passive, but also active, right? What would be, basically what would be the optimal geometric shape of the fin during flapping um, to, to maximize performance. So in a way where 
uh, we're inspired by the fish. We're not necessarily uh, trying to rediscover or reinvent the, the evolutionary cycle that got the fish to where they are. Uh, we're, we're looking at what is, you know, in an, in an abstract space, what is, what is the, the optimal shape that leads to um, the optimal hydrodynamic, the optimal shape for, for hydrodynamic. I guess, I guess what I'm saying though is in, in nature are, is the usefulness of your, your, Im, your improvement species dependent? Are there some species that hardly curve the fin when they swim versus others that curve it a lot? Or, or is it all one problem that we're looking at? No, no, there's definitely different uh, different types of swimmers. Uh, I would say like larger ones, maybe tuna, for instance, would, would be would have much stiffer fins than than these um, the bluegill sunfish, for instance, that I showed in the in the picture. Or at least it would have maybe a different type of of deformation. Uh, I think the other point though is that even the the fish that have uh, like the bluegill sunfish in the picture, even the fish that have demonstrably large kind of deformations or curvature or variations of fin, they do have control over that shape. And so it might be a scenario where they want to stiffen or they want to you know, increase, decrease the deformation of its shape actively um, for hydrodynamic reasons. And so uh, that is, uh, I think, a part that, that hasn't been, uh, that we don't know much about right now, like what is, to what extent do fish versus just that you know, elastic deformation take a role. But that, that means that our results uh, hopefully provide some insight what is the benefit of doing that and, and would fish be actually doing that? But I, I agree that would be, it would be very helpful to have more information from the biological side from what is the biological side of deformations observed, both in fish that have you know, very flexible fish and also in fish that have more stiffer fish. Yeah. Yeah. A be beautiful lecture, William. Thank you for this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, like, um, thanks, like, uh, Jeff, for your, uh, Jeffrey, for your question. So, uh, any other question? I see, like, some people, like, uh, um, you soon, like, not having the chat. Like, uh, do you want to raise, like, you know, unmute yourself, direct answer, or, or if, like, in five seconds, if you not, like, I'm just going to, uh, like, uh, um, speak your questions. I see one in the chat. Yeah, I was asking whether he want to ask, ask, ah, like, okay. in person directly. <laughs> so, so in a way, have a chance to interact with you with. But anyway, I, it doesn't seem so, but let, let me just like, you know, speak out like for all the audience, like if, who cannot see the chat. So basically, uh, Yu Song Tao asked like, you know, Professor Reis, a very interesting presentation. There should be some constraint on the volume of the flexible body when it deforms. For example, the volume is unchanged when the body deforms is a reasonable assumption. Uh, it seems that this constraint is not met in your study. Your numerical method to deform the body uh, for a very thin body, this may not be uh, uh, may not cause a significant difference. But for a thick body, enforce this constraint would be important to obtain the like correct result. Any re any thoughts on how this constraint may be enforced or in, uh, et cetera? So, when? yeah, that's a good point. I think there's a distinction between the um, the mid surface and the volume. Right, so that we're enforcing that the mid surface is uh, inextensible. So the area of our mid surface is uh, is gonna is we keep it constant, which basically means that if we have some sort of Gaussian curvature, right, the double curvature of our shape, we have to adjust the positions of the rays to essentially come closer together to make sure that the mid surface is actually of the same area. And that's uh, I think uh, a good starting point, also biologically because of the the membrane. Uh, we might, you might argue there could be wrinkling or there could be like a, a you know small curvatures of the membrane, but it, I think this is a good starting point. Then if you go from that to the body, uh, you're right that we have we have a thin body, so we're not worried too much about that. Um, I think if the the value of enforcing the constraint that the body remains constant volume. Um, if, if you think of like a, a thin shell, for instance, and you apply like a kirchhoff love assumption that the, the, the normals remain normal to the surface, you would, you would enforce that, that condition. If we have a, a very thick body, which is kind of moving away from, from biologically inspired flapping fins, um, I think you can 
uh, enforce that constraint by building up your shape so that you actually enforce the Kirchhoff love constraint, um, which preserves global volume. Locally, though, you're, you're still going to have strains, right? And that's also, I would argue, that's mechanically accurate, right? You want to, any curvature is going to lead to strains away from the mid surface. Um, and so I, I'm not so worried about you know enforcing enforcing that, and I don't think it's even possible probably to do that. So the global volume constraint would probably be conserved by um, applying some sort of Kirchhoff love assumption to the to the deformation to the deformed uh, shape of the fin. Okay, thanks. I hope that answers your question. Like uh, you soon, uh, anybody else? If not, like uh, let me like ask like uh, two questions. So, uh, so when again, I like your work. Like you know, even bef right before like the pandemic, like you know, uh, like you know, we have like conversation in your in your in your office then. So, um, uh, I saw a recent work from uh, Daniel Quinn from University uh, University of, like Virginia. They're like you know they're changing stiff stiffness of the joint, like for the for uh, for uh, robotic tuna can like you know enhance the like you know the uh, swimming performance, thrust performance efficiency for different like velocity, different like you know uh, mode shape, mode flapping mode. So basically, from your result, as you're like concluding, the changing of the like you know the um, the leading edge curvature, or even passively like with the like changing of the stiffness, like uh, uh, of the like the the plate like a stiffness, or is also able to like enhance like the performance of the 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 swimming. And I know you are also doing some like uh, maybe potentially experimentation or things, but this seems to be like you know, maybe even much more difficult, like you know, in like a changing the stiffness of the plate or things. Uh, have you think about some like you know things how to implement this like in, in real world or like you know to do experimentation or like you know, or is there still a secret like you know mission undergoing so? Um, so are you asking how to uh, how to do the inverse problem for like? A stiffness distribution on a plate is like in, in in like a real world. So like you know because like in numerical, yes, it's just like you know uh, like a like assign a number. But in the real world, like you know, so have you think start thinking about like you know, changing like the stiffness like you know, how? Oh, I see. Uh, um. Uh, okay, so I think the 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 one of the nice uh, parallels of of what I did with the leading edge curvature actuation and what fish ray fin fish do with their uh, shear based control of their individual rays is that this is you know this this type of actuation translates that's it's 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 easy to imagine the implementation in a real world case right you have only control at the leading edge of the fit of the uh of the fin and and so you would have to have some actuator on individual rays and george lauder has already done that on, on different robotic models in the past if we take this one step further and we say okay you know how would we uh, implement some sort of not just like leading edge control, but like you know volumetric control. Um, I think one way to do it is, is stiffness, but another way to do it is um, is basically using some of these type forty printing type techniques to have uh, actuation of let's say a surface, right? And so that's you're right. That's some of my other research is like yeah. trying to find out first what what would be the inverse problem and what and then also how do we experimentally realize that? And I'm working with uh, Will Bowley at BU. Who is doing? Who is an expert in, in 3D and 4D printing? Um, and so, one of the ways we are uh, imagining now is that uh, you know the, the shape changing lattice that I had in the beginning was changing shape based on the ambient temperature, but it's uh, possible to say, okay, we're going to change the temperature locally on the shape, right? So we're going to have like a fuel heater or something like that embedded in the shape, and that will change the temperature of each individual maybe sector of this of this shape. Of this lattice, and then you have a mechanism to, you know, actively control the amount of shape change that you want to impose, but also uh, different target shapes that you can achieve, and you can, you know, smoothly change between those target shapes. And so the associated inverse problem is going to be awesome and very, you know, uh, yeah, very interesting. But in terms of the experimental side, uh, it's actually, uh, you know. I think it's close. I think we can we can start to think about that, um, and so then you would have a way to you know implement any kind of policy you want to impose on the yep. shape of the fin during the flapping cycle. Implement that in an experimental um, uh, framework. 
and even actively learning to do what's the best performance, like you no, know, like you no know, optimization ways to like uh, in the experimental, like you no know, incrementally. Yeah, this is exciting. Like you know, especially I know like you are working on the four D like you no, know, like you know, surface problem. Last time you see the shrinking of like you no know, face mask. That's so awesome. Anyway, the, another question I have is more on the fluid side. So uh, the right now the flapping uh, thing is all uh, is swimming in the uniform flow that is like you know moving in its own body. So there is oncoming like a vortex, oncoming non-uniform, you know, uniform like all coming vortex, like reverse vortex street, all other fish are like all its own body. Do you think that the leading edge curvature like you know will in this scenario will be uh, both spin-wise and like you know quarter wise will be important a factor or even more important factor when controlling the like you know the oncoming vortex or maybe at that time like rigid and like you know when they have like curvature it's not going to be too too like you know make too much difference. So basically individual fish and have like a multiple fish like interaction, like, you know, for, for the uh, uh, importance, the important role for the leading edge curvature, like in this scenario. So, um, so, so uh, yeah, it's true. So we are like in a, still in a like idealized scenario where we don't, we just have a uniform flow. We don't have any effect of the upstream body. We don't have even the accurate kind of body, rigid body motions in our inflow as it's just a standard, you know, heave. And, and it, so we don't have like axial accelerations or things like that. Uh, but specifically on the effect of the uniform, of the non-uniform inflow, I think uh, there's there's two questions, right? One is that the, the uh, in a passively deforming fin, the vortex coming in is gonna change the shape of the fin. And so you're gonna have a different performance due to that. Uh, so, you know, there's a different hydrodynamic loading, there's a different shape, and that might lead to, you know, maybe loss of performance. And so if you want to think of the actively deforming fin, the question is, how do you correct for that? Or how do you adjust your shape of the fin to correct for the, you know, maybe the possible loss of performance you would get if you wouldn't do that with an incoming vortex uh, or an incoming uh, disturbed flow. And I think there, um, uh, that, that I think is one of the, it's related to this discussion slide I had, which might, you know, not everyone might agree with it, but I think that the, one of the benefits uh, of the curvature control is this localized, you know, kind of, it's almost like a, you know, a, a small correction on top of what the entire body is doing in terms of pitching and, and you know, heaving, which is essentially the body moving laterally, right? And so uh, if you, if you are, you know, if you're fishier, you're moving your body and you're swimming, you have the even pitch basically imposed by your body undulations, which are, uh, you know, operating maybe on a different scale than, than the leading edge curvature. So I think the leading edge curvature is actually a really nice mechanism to be able to kind of control uh, your shape of the fin rapidly uh, in, in related to, you know, disturbances that happen possibly due to an incoming vortex. Uh, that, that's, I think, what is uh, what will be interesting to uh, to investigate a bit more and, and think a bit more about. Yeah, especially like uh, considering like you know, like have the multi-body like a code is coming online more and more efficient, like more and more like you know strong like from your group, like it's maybe like you know, even more. Yeah, yeah, but I think it would be important to investigate maybe the baseline, which is what happens if you just have a passively deforming fin yeah. and uh, you shoot a vortex at it uh, compared to an undisturbed flow. Yeah. Uh, how much? Yep. How much do you actually want? How much does it, you know, reduce the performance? Do you actually want to come up with like a very sophisticated control thing to to correct yep. for it? Right. Like the vortex ring is coming, or like even a single vortex is coming. Like you know, how it's like you no. Know, yeah, you. Yeah, you have to come up with some sort of uh, kind of uh, yep. reduced order of space to investigate investigate it from. Yeah. Okay. I think the time is running out. Uh, uh, I think I want to. Like you know, uh, thank like uh, Professor Wen Van Rees for this like you know interesting talk, and uh, thank you very much for everybody coming. And uh, we actually really have really, really, uh, yeah, have we really run out of time? Because I had I had a follow up question to your leading edge curvature question. Okay, it depends you, on like a whim. Can you, can you so, like, one more question? He, it depends on like a whim. Like if he, I, I have time. Uh, are I, we I time. Are, are we overworking you there? But <clears throat> It's really a combination of my first question and uh, and Dicia's question. If we come back to if we come back to species in nature, do are there any that have no leading edge curvature, and and is that also something that this that the animal can control? Um, 
So I think the animal, so we know the animal can so control. I, animal, so we know the animal I think that's, uh, we don't know to what extent and in what scenarios exactly. We don't know to what extent and in what scenarios. So I think my, my approach here has been rather than, I don't have a, a, a fish tank, I, I don't look at fish. I, I want to see, you know, if, if we take that degree of freedom into account, what do we stand to gain from that? Or what does an animal stand to gain from that? Or for that matter, a robotic fish stand to gain from that? Um, so it's, it's, for me, I'm, it's a relevant question. Uh, it's not something I can answer with my kind of research. Um, I would be really interested in, in the answer to that question, but from my perspective, um, I'm thinking in a more broad way than just kind of fish, right? This is bio-inspired, but I'm not trying to, uh, you know, go and apply that back into biology necessarily uh, alone. I'm trying to think about what does this mean for, you know, both kind of soft robotics as well as kind of a broader biological context. So I'm, I'm, I'm I, I agree that it's an interesting question, and I would be interested in the in the answer to that, but I don't have I don't have that. Jeff, you are muted. Jeffrey, you're muted. Uh, I, 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 sorry about that. I, I, I didn't mean to narrow the focus here. It was just a, a passing curiosity, but I, I agree for the younger viewers here that your your research is a wonderful example of of uh, work work that is uh, curiosity driven and and it shouldn't limit itself to to what is available in nature, of course, that's, that's, but, but, but still, if, if I were a fish, that's all I'd, I, all I'd care about. And, and so, um, so anyways, I was just looking at from, from that point of view. Well done, William. Okay, thank you. Um, again, Sorry to interrupt uh, DCR, but thank you. Thank you yeah, for the extra okay. time. Oh, no, 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 of course, like it's way slime time. So like, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. So again, thanks like uh, Professor Reese, like uh, for his distinct, his nice talks. And uh, we have reached like 130 people for your talk. Like, you know, it's a, a new record like a win. So, <laughs> well, which awesome. is terrific. So, and uh, 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 the, the, the video will be revealed by Professor Reese and like once it's done, it will be posted online and will send like a reminder to everybody. And I want to take this opportunity again, thank like Professor Reese for his time and for you all attending. And also I want to give like an advertisement for next week talk will be like uh, Nicholas Shi from US Naval Research Laboratory for on the bio hybrid robotic jellyfish using micro electronics to drive the live jellyfish to swimming. Like, uh, so it's a, comp a combination of like, you know, real animal and like uh, electronics. So with that, uh, thank you very much, Wim, and thank everybody for coming. And I wish you a safe, uh, happy, and uh, like, you know, morning, evening, afternoon, and like, you know, yeah, see you next round. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for having me.